are connecting and we are live so hi everybody um, this session we're gonna have Carlos Steves and Greg Gurwich from Springer Nature they will talk a bit about Springer Nature uh, for this event the the feature of uh, raised hands will not be available but uh, please leave uh, questions on the on the side of the platform the Q&A and at the end of the session I will be answering I will be asking the questions and Carlos and Greg will be answering them okay so I'll pass the stage to Greg who's gonna start so go get it <laughs> thank you thanks Ruby uh, so hi, I'm Greg Gorwich. Uh, I uh, look after recruitment for technology and digital for Spring and Nature. Uh, I've been here for nearly two years, um, but I have been working in the recruitment industry for 15, um, which is why my hair's gone a little grey, I think. But um, uh, working across many industries, uh, digital transformation, um, uh, and then into uh, telecoms, banking, um, uh, retail, and publishing media um, with focus on multiple roles with uh, quite a lot of software development recruitment. So uh, I'm going to talk today about Spring and Nature. Uh, we've landed in Lisbon. Uh, Carlos would also be able to give you a lot more uh, information about it because he's instrumental in the strategy. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit on an overview about us as a company, who we are, what we do, and what technology means for us. So I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. So here we go. So hopefully you can all see this. So uh, as I said, I'm Greg, and there's Carlos as well. He's Global IT Director. Uh, and he'll be speaking after me. So, Spring of Nature, uh, who are we? We're a leading academic and education publisher. We uh, publish um, for scientific researchers, for students, for teachers, and for professionals around the world. Uh, we publish journals, uh, books, magazines, and open access content, um, which allows people to discover uh, and learn. Um, you can see at the bottom uh, some of the imprints that we have. So Springer Nature, obviously there, Springer, Nature, uh, uh, BMC, which is um, 20 years in open access content, uh, Palgrave, Scientific American, uh, it's more of a popular uh, kind of science publication. Macmillan Education, some of you, or maybe many of you will have heard of Macmillan Education as one of the world's leading schools publishers. Um, and you can see the others there. Um, so uh, we're a group uh, that has kind of uh, many different publications. Um, we're actually two companies that merged, or two groups that merged uh, five years ago. The merger of Nature Publishing Group, uh, Powergrave, Macmillan Education, Springer Science, um, to create essentially a super group uh, and now a uh, certainly top four uh, scientific and education publisher. Um, and we're reaching millions and millions of people. Um, and certainly our platforms and technology solutions um, are enabling that to reach millions and both myself and Carlos will tell you a bit more about some of that. Um, but although we're five years old as Spring of Nature, uh, as you can see, we're a merged business, um, the actual brands go back 175 years. You know, Nature has been, is the most cited scientific journal in the world. Uh, many of you will have heard of it. Uh, Springer goes back, I think they were formed for a similar time in the 1800s. So these are historic scientific publications. But what we're going to be talking about is how uh, we're using technology and digital to enable uh, the whole world to access this and, uh, uh, and improve. 
So let's talk about IT. IT department, we've got about 1,000 employees spread around the globe. Um, there's about 13,000 people that work for Springer Nature across the whole business, but 1,000 or so are in IT. We've got five divisions working across all areas of IT um, and ultimately enabling uh, Springer Nature to be at the forefront of digital publishing. You've got, these are the five divisions. Um, won't speak too much about the other four at this, this point because I think we'll, we'll focus on what we're doing in digital, but you know, IT portfolio operations delivery, um, certainly looking across the portfolio and deliverables, uh, engineering and enablement, um, building, creating scalable, reusable um, uh, kind of building blocks um, uh, that we need. Uh, business systems, well, IT needs to make sure that you know we're all working right. We have the systems at Spring and Nature that work great for us. Uh, IT operations, uh, as you can see there, database engineering, very important, um, infrastructure, platform support. Um, but SN Digital, really, we're talking about uh, the products and the platforms that are kind of reaching outwardly to the world. Um, you'll see there, and I'll talk a bit more about it now, and Carlos will tell you a lot more because he's right in the middle of it. But uh, uh, content acquisition, content consumption, education, uh, professional and shared services, you know, these are things that touch outwardly. So you've got, uh, you know, researchers, scientists, students, teachers kind of accessing these platforms and doing, doing what they need to do for themselves. So I've said it before, and you can see it here, you know, we want to be at the forefront uh, of digital publishing. Um, we want to make technology our competitive advantage. And how do we do that? We collaborate. Um, we're cross-departmental. I'll talk more about that, and Carlos will probably give you a bit more context. Um, we look at what the customer problems are um, and we look to solve what they solve those problems by creating, running, and maintaining those solutions. Um, the way we work, the principles that we use, continuous improvement, continuous delivery lean principles allow us to adapt to the changes in the publishing industry. And again, Carlos is, is much more a uh, better place to talk about that. Value, um, maximizing tech through kind of prioritizing, and then people, and we need you know, the right people, you know, the right time, the right skills. Uh, and that's kind of where I come in to help recruit and retain grow talent uh, and ensure that we thrive. So this is the manifesto in technology. You know, ultimately, Spring and Nature is a publishing company, but Amazon is also a shop and Netflix is also a TV channel. And they're all doing things with technology um, to enable people to access that content in the best and most useful way. Um, and ultimately, you know, science will continue to be produced, research will continue to be done, um, articles and books will be written, and maybe, you know, science will continue as it is. But what is changing is how that content's acquired, accessed and delivered, and, um, you know, our users want an easier life. They want uh, everything, everywhere. Uh, and that's not just true of publishing, that's true of all content. Uh, and so we're very much in the middle of that and ensuring that happens. And technology is what makes it possible. So, uh, so certainly looking at that being a competitive advantage. So let's talk a little bit about SN Digital. Um, that's, as you can see, responsible for maintaining, delivering millions of articles read by researchers, scientists, and students. I don't think Carlos has got some stats on how that, how, how much, but you can see there. First of all, you take something like nature.com, you know, that publishes original research across scientific fields um, for about 3 million unique readers every month. For an example, nature.com, you know, it's Biomed Central. It's the world's largest open access publisher. You've got Springer Link delivering 10 million scientific documents. So it's an enormous amount of content. Uh, we're certainly at the top of what we do in the science world. Um, 
but what we're working on is transforming and enabling that content uh, to be um, kind of world class when it comes to how it's uh, accessed, how uh, content gets to us, and how the content gets to the world. So just a quick overview of how we actually work. I'm sure by looking at Spring and Nature, you'll kind of be interested to know how do you actually set yourself up from an organizational perspective. So as you can see down there, you have uh, the, the, the different disciplines, business analysts, software developers, back, that's back-end developers, front-end developers, um, although you know our developers often Come, they come from full stack experience. We, we, we have uh, front end enablement teams and back end teams specifically. Um, so if you enjoy, you know, pure back ends, it's something you're definitely going to get to be able to work on. Uh, project management, uh, QAs, and then UX. So we have all of those disciplines, and they're working across the domains. And you can see underneath content acquisition, that is how do we get the content from them to us and who's them, scientific researchers doing amazing work. Carlos will talk more about the type of things they're doing, but as you can imagine right now in the world, there's a lot of uh, content being sent from scientists to be published. Very important moment that we're having uh, regarding, you know, life sciences. So, you know, we're enabling that to happen. So how do we get that from them to us? How do we build the products that allow that to happen? Content consumption, that's once we've uh, approved that the scientific research is good, going through peer review processes, going through other things. How does that content get to the world? And as you saw before, there's millions and millions of articles. So it's a huge amount of work to be done, not only maintaining that, but building the products that allow people to access it. Uh, education is a domain. You know, we support for Macmillan Education uh, schools, teachers and students interacting with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, in my day, uh, we used to kind of give a book in for homework. And as you can imagine, I'm sure if you have kids and you know that that has totally changed and we, we build those products um, or we help maintain those products as well. Um, the uh, professional domain and the shared, shared services being more about things that are neither content acquisition, either getting the content from... Uh, whoever wants to submit to us um, or, or content consumption, whoever wants to you know, read our content, uh, the shared services are things in the middle. A good example would be identity uh, and access and those types of things uh, linked very closely to data as well, because we like to know who is interacting with us. And for example, if you are sharing content, but also discovering content, you may be the same person. So looking at projects around that, you can see a little bit around the sides about how that works, but the disciplines, you know, you know, kind of report into a global head of, and then the domain leads uh, are kind of IT directors, and Carlos is is one of those. I won't spend too much on this. I think I've just mentioned it. Content acquisition, uh, you know, examples there. Um, a lot of work going on in open access. Um, a lot of work going on in our submissions transformation. I won't spend too much time because Carlos is running that, so I'll leave that to him. Uh, content consumption, the content. Nature careers is a big thing regarding, you know, scientific jobs that we're involved with, uh, kind of publishing that. Um, but a lot of the consumption is happening around accessing science. Education, we discussed that, I won't spend too much here. Uh, and professional and shared service I just mentioned. So we work in a fast moving agile culture. We work multidisciplinary teams in a domain structure. So I've mentioned that uh, we're global. So we're based in London, Berlin, Pune, New York, Madrid, Dortrecht, Heidelberg, now Lisbon. I think we, you know, the main hubs, if you want, are London, Berlin, Pune, um, and Lisbon will be a main hub. Um, and uh, we've already, I think, hired 25 plus people since we opened the doors in May, um, and uh, is going to be a major player with the group. Uh, working collaboratively with your colleagues in other countries. Um, 
So I've mentioned the type of disciplines we have, and obviously you're interested in the back-end developers, I'm sure. Um, so we look for skilled and passionate software developers to help us build those products. And ultimately the mission is to enable the scientific research community to do what they need to do, advance and progress um, the understanding of science and actually get the science to, to us. So very, very important gateway in the scientific process, uh, a great responsibility. And when you're looking at roles and what jobs to take and what things to do, I think, you know, a mission and feeling a sense of reward in what you do uh, is, is important to a lot of developers. and. I think that you know knowing that you're helping getting science published is probably a nice feeling and that's a lot of people when i speak to people in the company they 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 tell me that's a major factor for them that they feel that they're producing something that will do good um we use kotlin i know a lot of you will be java developers uh but we've decided to use kotlin um but we don't hire kotlin developers um, we do if, if, if we can, but it's not a necessity. It's not a, it's a nice thing because, you know, you can maybe go straight in on day one, but actually we, we, we are very, very happy. And I think I would say more than 70% of the hires we make are Java developers who are very, very interested in the latest developments in Kotlin are quite keen on learning, learning something new. I, I, I'm not technical enough to talk about the, the differences, but I know from Java 8 to 11 that it's going that way. So, uh, you know, certainly a, a, a very good skill to add if you haven't got Kotlin and we don't um, discriminate against non-Kotlin developers because it's actually very new, as I'm sure you know, um, and we use it as back-end technology. Um, we use a lightweight toolkit, HTTP 4K. Uh, it's not that well known, but it's very, very good and works brilliantly for us. Um, uh, so that's something else to bear in mind. We use cloud, so deploy in Cloud Foundry. We use Google Cloud Platform as well. Uh, we're a TDD environment, test-driven development, uh, working with pair programming a lot. Um, I let Carlos just tell you more about our releasing, um, which is uh, a, a lot. So he, he'll be able to give you more information. And it's a CI/CD environment. And again, Carlos can talk to you more about that. So it's easy to write this stuff down, but ultimately, to be be honest, you know, working in that environment, working in the offices, and seeing how when people are, you know, you actually see this in in reality. Um, people are happy. We have a community environment. We actually, it, you know, put put. Uh, a, a structure in place that allows the freedom. We'll talk about some of our values, but allow people to interact. We're, we're very collaborative. We have a community manager who looks after events, uh, make sure everyone's happy in terms of where things are and what's going on. Um, we've got a lot of initiatives, but we really like to hire people that are friendly, inquisitive, who want to really get involved, who love to learn. Um, uh, and we look for the culture to be added to. It's it's not just a culture fit. It's a culture add. So we have values and we want to make sure those values are in place and we believe in those. But we're also looking to develop that and people that want to push that. And that's uh, that's really important to us. And we really want ideas and we want them to thrive. And, you know, forcing into a very rigid kind of way uh, can actually stifle that. So we're very conscious of that and we do things about it. It's not just like nice to say in a presentation that we have a nice culture. We're doing, we're doing things and, and Carlos has got some more information on that as well. But, you know, culturally, uh, lots of, uh, interactions, um, uh, lunch and learns, um, and, uh, events that allow people we have 10 percent time which allows people to do a project outside of their work um and you know we want everyone to contribute and we have a very transparent way of working so very respectful and these are the things you know we like to collaborate we like to innovate 10 percent time which means every other friday people get together and they discuss uh the, so they kind of work on something that isn't a project so it isn't based on the project they've been working on. Um, and that's presented back to everyone. So it could be a group thing. It could be on your own. We don't mind. Um, but like, we like you to share it at the end. Uh, mastery, you know, we want you to become the best that you can be. Someone that loves knowledge, wants to learn. 
uh, wants to take ownership, needs a purpose. And I feel like Serena Nature being a scientific publisher is somewhere where you can really kind of get that from this, but also your own personal career purpose and want something you know better for yourself. Uh, user focused, we have, we're a digital team that deals with people that are trying to solve problems and we want to make their life easier. Uh, transparency, as mentioned before, you know, the way that we recruit, the way that we, you know, do everything, everyone is kind of, uh, kind of has, has, has a view. Um, and it's okay to fail. That's absolutely kind of part of growing and we are, we embrace it. Uh, and, uh, unfortunately it happens, but actually by embracing failure, it seems to, uh, have an effect on more success. So, uh, and then very importantly, life balance, you know, um, so let's talk about that here. So we've opened a new Lisbon hub uh, in 2020. Uh, we kind of started looking at hiring people early in the year and then we kind of opened the doors in May, kind of opened the doors and then just kind of shut them. I don't know, like it comes up and down with, uh, with, with COVID, but um, you don't need to go in at the moment, um, but you can if you want, uh, depending on uh, the situation. Uh, in Lisbon particularly. Uh, you can see where we're based, so we're very, very central. Uh, food allowance is good. Um, we don't get that where I am in London. Um, it would be really useful considering the cost of eating and uh, where our office is in London. Um, but 10% uh, time I've discussed, so we call that kind of hack day or 10% time. You can do something that is different. LinkedIn learning, that is uh, access to you know, learning platforms. We've also got a learning and development platform that we build ourselves. It's very, very good. Uh, lots of things. It's not just technical. It's uh, everything from public speaking to uh, agile. Um, you know, we use Kanban a lot. Um, so you might want to kind of open that up. Lots of different um, opportunities there to learn and also to discuss about further learning opportunities. Um, we're very open to it. Um, if you're interested in tech stuff, there's a lot of SM publications that will be interesting to you. And there'll be a lot of stuff that you'll find very interesting. We've got, mi we've got th millions of articles, thousands of publications. So, you know, you'll be able to find something very great interest, but something specific to what you want to learn is probably there and therefore, you know, could save you some money on uh, on, on getting that elsewhere, uh, private health insurance, other insurances. You can work two days per week from home um, and you can request a third if there's a business case for it. So very good split between working from home and working in the office at the moment until things get to a normal state. Um, uh, you'll be working remotely at home, but you can come into the office if you want. And we run a traffic light system depending on the local governments uh, for all, all the countries. We have 50 offices around the world, so it's a complex crisis management structure, but uh, it's working well, really well. Um, you get a mobile and your travel costs for up to 40 euros per month are covered. And that is me talking for a huge amount of time. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to Carlos. Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, I'm just going to try to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Right. Can you see my screen? All good? I can see it. So Perfect. Hopefully everyone Hi. Uh, thanks, Greg. So um, just to uh, first to introduce myself, I'm Carlos Estevez. Uh, as Greg said, I'm a Global IT Director at Spring of Nature. I've been a uh, well, I would say leading some of the some of the setup of the office in Lisbon. So I'm just giving a sense of purpose as well to what we're trying to do and what we're trying to say here today. Uh, and just to introduce some numbers as well in terms of spring and nature, like Greg said, we're more than 30,000 employees worldwide, present in more than 50,000 countries, 1.3 billion yearly revenue. But I am Portuguese, so I know what the fact that spring of nature is not known in portugal so what do we do right so this is what we do we're not the guardian of course but the the, the contents of the, the the news is what we do we advance science right 
we advance scientific discovery. We're an enabler of new methodologies, new research, new discoveries worldwide. That is our purpose. That is what we believe we bring back to society. And I have to say, it's quite a noble task to be in that place. Um, right now, we are helping to solve a problem to a global pandemic. It's not many people that, are, that have the pleasure to work in such a, such a noble um, industry, to be honest. So this is roughly what we do. We allow people, mostly scientific researchers, to submit their content with us. We help validate and quality check. And then finally, we make it available for consumption to further uh, enable more uh, scientific discovery and, and studies, etc. cetera. Um, so this is what is at our heart to enable the, the world to evolve, to enable our world, our, our, the human nature to, to develop further, right? which I think is really interesting to, to think about. So we do that by developing quite a lot of platforms. We develop uh, all our content and the majority of our revenues, I would say close to 90% come from uh, the digital space. So we're a digital company. Um, we, like Greg said, we have 13,000 or more than 10 million documents. Uh, I'll go through some numbers later, but we make them available in, um, in platforms like these, uh, like Nature, but also like Springlink, which is, one of, one of our big databases that we allow people to use. It's really accessible. Some of the content is available because it's open access. Some other depends on whether you are part of an institution that has access, but this is roughly what we do as a business. Some stats around our platforms, we have more than 3000 journals. Uh, so the, the, the scientific manuscripts go into individual journals. Uh, our platforms collect more than four, uh, 60 million page views on a monthly basis. Uh, we have more than 1 million yearly uh, article submissions to our platforms. So everything is digital at the moment at Spring and Nature. Talking about how the platforms are built. Uh, like Greg said, we're a major Kotlin house. We embarked on this journey four years ago, roughly four years ago, or three or four years ago, I can't remember. Um, but, but this was a lot of emphasis we've put on and this, this choice, because we truly believed um, that was the right to the right call. Uh, we're on the cloud, we have Google Cloud, we deploy quite often using Cloud Foundry. Um, and we still have some for some of our back, well, mo majority of the front end services, we have Node.js applications, we have some back end services in Node.js as well, uh, smaller services, and we still have some of the applications in Scala, but mostly. Um, I would say the majority of our technology and landscape is Kotlin. Like Greg said as well, we put a lot of emphasis on TDD and, uh, and we believe per pair programming is key. Uh, we used to da do that in, in the office quite often. Now we do it remotely. It's just a different way to do it. Nevertheless, uh, we're highly focused on continuous integration. So that means we deploy a lot. Um, across the business, well, across all the thousand people we we're talking about, close to 2,000, 3,000 deployments on a daily basis. So it's quite a lot moving, uh, quite a lot going on across the organization. Uh, that means that, this means that we have a lot of agility, but we have also elements in the culture that enable it. Um, when you join our teams, we don't have established processes, right? We don't have a, a framework that's gonna work for you or for gonna work for you, all the single, all teams, we focus a lot on the principles, on the on the values. So we enable that level of agility and we enable teams to adapt and to sort out their processes the best way they can. So we don't put a lot of emphasis on technology choices or, um, or well, not technology choices, but the tools that teams need because they should be able to adapt them to their, to their own needs. The area where we really invest a lot is on our community. Uh, I know it's uh, quite a lot, well, it's a lot more difficult now that we're remote and with COVID. Nevertheless, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on building a social element. We believe that collaboration is key, especially when you're working really closely with each other, when you have to close to collaborate, to pair program, to do breakdown sessions, whatever it is. Uh, but we put a lot of emphasis on building uh, up our community at SN Digital. Uh, but we also enable people to build up, right? Like Greg said, we, 
we're a major Kotlin house, which means that it's very difficult sometimes to get people to join us with previous experience. It's not that easy. There's more um, of a community building up on the Android world right now, but um, we realize that. And because of that, we hire quite a lot of people that are more, that bring our principles, that bring our ways of thinking, and more than the, sometimes the technology itself, the technology experience, because we know we can work with that. We can develop you from a technology standpoint, but the principles and the ways of working and your approach, that is something harder to change. So we put a lot of emphasis as well on enabling you to have budget for training, for going to conferences, uh, going to Velocity in San Francisco, going to whatever, right? Going to courses all, all, all wherever you need them. Uh, because we, we want you to learn, we want you to experiment, and that is something that is really close to our culture. Not just the innovation, not just the training, but also we give you time to try something new. Um, so picking up on Google's um, very famous 20% time, we have 10% time at Spring and Nature Digital, which means that every other Friday, you literally have the whole day um, to work on your personal project, to work on new skills to build something you haven't thought of before. Um, some people have written books, some people have uh, developed uh, games in micro eight, so, so, some, something like you can try, you can do whatever you want um, in order to further develop yourself. And that is something we put a lot of effort on, making sure it's successful as well. Last but not least, we have Lunch and learns quite often. Uh, we have people now slightly more difficult given that we're not in the office. Uh, but it's very common to have people giving talks during lunchtime. We get pizza in, um, we get food, whatever it is. Um, so people can suggest to, to do a talk. Uh, sometimes we have some of our consultants coming in and even practicing some of the, the talks they're going to do um, in, a, in conferences worldwide. So there's a lot of learning. There's a, a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of challenging uh, the status quo at Spring and Nature as well. So that was that was more the cultural side. Now focusing on, on Lisbon. Um, so we started in Lisbon. We decided to kick off Lisbon uh, late last year, late 2019. Uh, we started operations in March. Uh, we've hired so far 25 people, so we did it all fully remote. Uh, we have a place in uh, Marques de Pombal, so very central. Uh, but right now we are still quite, a, we still have a lot of positions to open for. Uh, Lisbon is strategic for spring in nature on um, the technology area. Uh, we believe there's uh, high potential. Uh, there's really good talent. And there are really good schools around as well. So there's, it's a very significant and a, and a, and a key long-term investment that Spring Nature is making. Therefore, we're hiring for all sorts of roles right now, from back-end to front-end, project management, data scientists, UX designers, researchers, you name it. Um, so if you're interested at all, uh, reach out to us. Uh, feel free to connect with us on any Here's the website connected with us on, on, on any of the platforms you, uh, you wish. And, um, and yeah, that was, um, a bit of the, the introduction that we wanted to give you and, and a bit of our pitch of why it's, why we think Spring Nature is a, a really good company to join. Thank you. So thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Greg. So we have here some questions. You guys can can keep leaving questions, please. Uh, I will read these two. So the first one is uh, maybe Carlos, uh, maybe stop sharing the screen. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the first question here is, what is the one thing that you would say that differentiates Springer Nature from similar companies career-wise? Um, so I think that is a very interesting question. So I have to say that I, for example, I joined Springer Nature six years ago. Uh, before that, I would, I would be hopping jobs every other year, I would say. Um, and I think what is different about Spring and Nature is the fact that nothing is set in stone. And we value collaboration quite a lot. 
Um, so that's why I don't spend that much time talking about technology choices or te the technology stack or how we develop software because everything is up for discussion. Um, six years ago, the company was completely different. We had different ways of working. We had different technology choices. Um, but, but I think what is different is the fact that you can come in and you can say, well, I think that is rubbish. And I think we should do it this way. And a lot of people are gonna listen to you. And if you're able to convince people around, you can literally turn the company around or the technology area around, right? You have that ability. And um, and that is, I think is quite unique uh, because I've joined a lot of companies, I've met a lot of people where sometimes you want to try something new, you want to suggest something new, and there's already a playbook written and you can't go outside of that. There is already a process defined and you can't actually move or even to change something really small takes quite a lot of time and effort. I think at Spring in Nature, we're able to collaborate a lot to drive change and to drive improvements. And that for me is quite unique, to be honest. I mean, I'll, I'll just add, um, so my job is talent, you'll see talent and resourcing manager. So a lot of what I'm doing as well is not just external hiring, but is actually working with Carlos, with uh, other uh, directors and hiring managers, um, and looking internally at who we have and what they want to do and part of their gut part of their career frameworks when they work with their managers is they're very uh, um, encouraged to say what they want to do with their career so I sp I've spent in 2020 a, a huge vast amount of time moving people from one team to another and I don't think in the past times I've not seen that now not just in the discipline which is interesting people sometimes get very interested in data they may want to go off and do some more uh, personal development in data science or data analytics from software development. We're seeing quite a few people move from software development to data engineering. If that's what they want to do, they may wish to get into project management. And the, I'd say that you know people do move within companies, but the encouragement to do it here is uh, something I think makes us stand out. So once you get a job with us, it doesn't mean you're stuck in that. And also going back to what Carlos said, is that because we generally don't just have like one team doing this type of technology and that team does that technology, we hire the people. It's very easy for you after maybe two years, if you've done two years with a project, 18 months, two years, and you say, ah, I think it's time for something a bit more interesting. You can kind of move people around. So you can always keep interested. And we have a very, very low turnover of staff for an IT globally. I mean, it's just, it's, it's almost unbelievable how few people leave the company, but also um, we have contractors. And as you know, the contractor market, it's very rare that people want to go perm. And we have a, quite a lot who say, I, I'd like to stay here and permanently. And there may be some sacrifices they make for the variety of work, for the maybe the rate they earn. But actually, they want to stay. So I think they're they're things that I would I would highlight and what makes us kind of an interesting and different company. So it's the empowerment, right? It's like giving the the power to people. And uh, do you feel are you guys or do you guys consider yourselves uh, software agnostic in a way that? Uh, um, you can expand uh, to which area do you want technologically? Um, uh, this question maybe is more for Carlos, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so not completely agnostic, meaning okay. that we, we still have our, uh, I'm not sure if many people know about the ThoughtWorks uh, tech radar, which is one of the instruments of validating like in mm -hmm. the industry, some of the technology choices. We have our internal internal version of things we're all try we are trialing, things we're actually using, and things that we're trying to deprecate. So for example, we have we had a lot of, for example, Ruby on Rails applications due to several mergers we had, and that is on the deprecation layer, right? We we fully focus on JVM languages for backend development, that's clear. Front end, there's a bit of a mixture of Node.js with some TypeScripts. There are different ways to approach it. So we're not fully agnostic, but it doesn't mean that next year we're not going to work on a different technology that we're evaluating now that becomes something we want to adopt. 
Yes. Okay. So, so that's the flexibility we're talking about, like, and the importance that one can make in the in the company. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, as a former tech, I find that very interesting because I start as a developer, then I moved to QA engineering, and uh, that was something that uh, I was also fascinated when I was working uh, because uh, that. Um, that opportunity to grow and to expand yourself and to make an impact to the company, it seems, I mean, for me, it was great. And I feel that, as you are saying, in Springer Nature, th that happens as well. So that was, uh, that's very cool, I would say. So let me see another question. We have, as the personal project time on Fridays to, to as the, pro the, pro the personal project time to be related with the company, uh, not really. Um, ideally, okay. so ideally we would want people to solve business problems. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, there is we allocate that time to enable people to grow in many, many different areas. Uh, sometimes you might be developing something that is completely off the context where we are, but but you can reapply some of that learning, some of that thinking in something mm -hmm. that is business centric, right? So we had someone literally write a book that actually was slightly relevant. Uh, someone that actually wrote a book about product development okay. throughout one, one and a half years. Would you say, did that bring value to the business? Well, not directly, meaning that he wasn't actually developing a product, but he was thinking about the product development cycle. He was yes. collecting insights from the industry. He was sharing that knowledge. That's pretty cool, I think. Uh, we have someone else now uh, writing a 2D kind of retro game in Pico 8. Is that bringing value to the company? No, but it's it's fun. You get a lot of people yeah. collaborating, people that want to design like sprites for the game from different teams, right? So you get you you get benefits that might not be fully business centric. So I think it was a year and a half ago or two years ago that we ran a session where we turned that day into a kind of a, a innovation day where we had like people playing uh we even had like a band with people from different teams playing uh playing songs and someone and but the goal was to because someone was trialing a new machine learning model to see if they could identify the individual instruments even when you play with the whole band so some of that might is not relevant but you can reapply some of that learning and some at least you bring people together, bring that level of collaboration, mm -hmm. and you're just challenging the status quo and what you do on a on a day by day basis. To be honest, yeah, like a talent show inside your company. Yeah, sure. that that's fun. So we have another question here. Um, how was the remote setting adaptation? I can answer that one as well. Um, so we uh, before the the lockdown began. Um, two weeks before that, we were in a in a in a in a meeting uh, that we do on a monthly basis, on a reporting meeting, and we made the call to to say, all right, because we're seeing the trends, let's fully try the whole the whole IT department going uh, going fully remote. So probably two weeks before the lockdown happened, uh, just to identify, we wanted to do a trial run, see if we were identifying any problems. Uh, we ran that, no big issues, some like connectivity and access to certain certain um, certain networks, nothing major. Um, it allowed us to identify the tooling that was required as well. So when the full blown uh, lockdown happened, we were actually more than ready. So we flipped from one day to the other, like productivity uh, on a regular on a on a on an average basis was. So there was no impact on performance. Uh, it was funny. Well, the, the interesting fact was that we started Lisbon, the Lisbon operation fully remote, okay. which was an interesting challenge. So we started interviewing everyone remotely. Uh, we ended up meeting some people only when they started. Well, we met everyone when they started only. Some people haven't been able even to meet face to face um, because they live in, in different uh, circumstances and they don't feel um, well, they don't feel inclined to 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 travel, um, so it has it has been really easy to adapt. To be honest, uh, we haven't seen any impact. I think the, the biggest issue is just 
what every other company or what I think every company is facing right now, which is the um, how do you force uh, work-life balance? How do you force people to shut down their laptops at 5 30 uh, and not respond to emails in the evening right that for me and i'm suffering from the same thing from the same problem of the the lines between work and life starting to blur and that for me is serious besides that the actual adaptation like it was very very easy to be honest do you feel that uh, the communication between teams was affected I think at the beginning, I, I'm asking this because uh, I, I've seen many many companies that they are struggling. For instance, the communication between teams. For instance, the your uh, IT team, your technology team. Probably yeah. they talk together really well, but maybe talking with another sectors of the company, maybe it's affected. That's why I'm asking this. We so we were always a global. We've been a global business for quite some time. Uh, part of the group I run is spread across five locations, right? Okay. So we have teams in the US, teams in London, teams in, in Germany, India, and some people in the Netherlands. So regardless of what you do, you're already remote. The team's already, well, their, their mindset is already thinking about, okay, we're remote, we're in a remote setup. We need to collaborate with teams that are not sitting next to me. Nevertheless, I think some, some of the communication lines um, kind of disappeared a little bit, kind of the informal, the the informal communication you get in the office the five minute conversation just tapping someone on the shoulder and say hey I, I i need an answer about this becomes slightly more difficult it becomes a meeting of half an hour or an hour so that ruins a lot of your i i spend my whole day in meetings and i think the majority of the people probably attending are facing the same problem that means communication is slightly harder. It takes longer sometimes to get agreement. But the fact that we're we are, we're already a global uh, setup, we had already a global setup, made it quite uh, quite easy to to adapt in terms of inter team communication. To be honest. Thank you. So we have another question here from Luis. A question for Greg. What was the impact of scientific dissemination about COVID nineteen researches had on Springer Nation publications? Wow, I'm I'm very honoured that they would like me to answer that question. Is the <laughs> is the is the you asking what was the impact of COVID nineteen on our publications? Uh, the question is what was the impact of scientific dissemination about COVID nineteen researches add on Springer Nature publications? Well, I mean, uh, Carlos, I you you look like you're about to say yeah, something. Yeah, I can pick that one if you want. Well, so, you, go, you go first. So COVID want, was really want. interesting. Okay, I'm not sure if there's a lag a little bit, but I'll, I'll try to explain. So it, COVID was a really interesting uh, example of, so for example, our company was incredibly boring, right? You look at the company and you think, oh, you sell books or you sell research. No one knows who you are until you actually face a global pandemic and then you become slightly more prominent. Everyone wanted to, to work for uh, slightly more exciting technology uh, companies that are now facing slightly more trouble. So from a resilience point of view of the business, we're, we're highly resilient. So from a financial point of view, it was actually quite quite stable for us. Like we need to, and there's a lot to research. Um, in terms of the impact on the business, uh, that was it. In terms of the impact on scientific dissemination, we made, so for example, we made all the content on COVID-19, COVID all the publications free for people to access. So even though some of the content is behind the paywall, as we call it, we made it completely available. We uh, changed some of the access, uh, access, um, uh, well, the access profiles, the access methodologies to make it even more easy. So we implemented something like persistent cookie. So if you log in once, then you're, you're free to go. You can, you're, or in your institution or your in your university, you don't need to be there, right? We, you have a persistent cookie that gives you access everywhere. Um, but we also noticed a lot of submissions, a lot of content coming in, a lot of people, um, because the focus of the scientific community uh, went so much to COVID-19 that we saw a lot of people researching this area, running a lot of clinical trials, doing doing a lot of publications. So we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that we could support that process from a publishing point of view as well, making it more flexible for the author to 
need more or to revise the manuscript, making it more uh, trying to speed up the, the, the publishing process in the, those manuscripts as well. Uh, so we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that we can all solve this problem. It's, it's a bloody global pandemic at the end of the day. And uh, Greg, do, do, you, do you feel that the COVID affected uh, Springer Nature hiring plans, for instance? Like, uh, did you reduce the, the people you were hiring? Uh, it had the opposite uh, effect of hiring more? How did it affect the... Uh... Well, we're opening a new office and we've got big strategic plans to grow it. So to be honest with you, it's been very, very busy. As you could, you know, really the doors opening around may maybe starting a few months before we're at 25 people uh we're probably going to have a pipeline of you know five or six more coming up soon in terms of coming to join us so uh in terms of uh, activity as busy as ever um it's uh, you know ultimately you've got to change i've been running sessions with teams on how best to do virtual interviews things like that but um I mean, because we're in a fortunate situation that, you know, we're in a market in which, you know, it, it, it's, it's secure enough to continue. Whereas I'm very conscious when I talk to candidates, you know, they may not have been looking for new opportunities, but they're working in travel or in hospitality or anything related to airports or whatever it is, you know. So, um, so it's been pretty much business as usual in terms of continuing recruitment, but in fact lifted a little bit by uh, a, a big plan to have a very, very strong office in Lisbon. I would add as well that we are uh, pretty much according to the initial plans. So we wanted by the end of the year to have close to 25, 30 people. We're there. Um, we want to keep doubling those numbers in the next upcoming years. So we want to hire sustainably as well. We don't want to go for a ma massive hiring free uh, hiring spree and ruin uh, the actual culture we're trying to build in. So we're taking our time. It's a long-term investment. It's going according to plan. We haven't noticed. I, 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 the other interesting part is because we started remotely doing it, then I think what we saw in the in, in the beginning, because I was speaking with a lot of candidates as well, that were slightly afraid to move during the beginning of the pandemic in March and April, they were really uncertain. So what, what I tried to do personally was to spend a bit of time explaining them because no one knows the company to explain what we're actually trying to achieve. So we had even cases of like really amazing developers, uh, some from a, a competitor that is doing a presentation at the same time, actually, um, <laughs> that said in the beginning, sorry, I'm not going to go. I just had a, I just had a kid and, um, and I just don't feel secure. And then because they, re they realized how much effort and, and attention we were putting into the process, one month and a half later, they reach out again and say, Hey, are you, are you guys still okay if I join now? And they joined a month later, right? So we were able to adapt and I think everyone was able to adapt to just being a remote setup and like life doesn't stop. If you want to just change jobs, why wouldn't you? Yes, yes, that, that, that seems great. Uh, I'm just checking if we have any more questions. I don't think so. Uh, but uh, Greg and Carlos will be on the on the lounge uh, right after we close this session. So you guys can go there like join a, a room where they are, you can see them there. And then you can ask something, talk more uh, personally. So um, I will say that this is probably our goodbye. And uh, Carlos and Greg, it was a, a pleasure. I mean, Springer Nature was really well put in here. Uh, you, you guys did a terrific job. I mean, uh, I already knew Springer Nature and uh, I mean, I really liked the, the points that you, that you brought as a, an ex tech guy, uh, as myself, I, I felt uh, really connected with some of the things that you brought to the table and I really like your presentation. And once again, thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the time. And thanks for the people attending to this session. So you guys can join Greg and Carlos on the lounge. Okay.